the first international criminal tribunal since World War II and Nuremberg will prosecute the individuals responsible for planning and carrying out crimes against humanity. It's like a tsunami and you're following and you're seeing what's left. It was so dark because the street lights had been shot out and there was a bloody handprint on the wall. It felt like a, a horror movie. It felt as though we were dropped on Mars and our job was to make something happen. The trial is set to start on Thursday. It's now a Monday. I have no witnesses. People were scared. Do you blame them? They killed this witness. It was not just a bit of intimidation. Rape was a war crime since 1919. I mean, I'm not saying they were in force. I'm just saying that the law was on the book. The facts are so compelling. Why aren't we doing something about this? The Office of the Prosecutor was discouraging us from doing it. We were really worried. I was damned if I was going to disappear. No one had ever been prosecuted for rape in time of war, ever. Suddenly, something just breaks. decided that they were going to pray. They said, we speak only the truth and to say what they saw and not what they heard. And that they want justice, not revenge. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Congratulations on your film. Thank you so much. Thanks for having me here, you guys. This is, I didn't know what I was walking into, and I didn't realize there was an audience. I was like, oh, this is going to be so awesome. Oh, OK. So. <laughs> I'm glad that sentence ended with, this is going to be awesome. Well, I was going to say rad, but that totally dates me. Oh, wait, rad? <laughs> I just said it. rad here. Um, Michelle, how did you get started on this film? How did, uh, where, did it, where did it start for you? <laughs> I don't know how many of you have been stuck on the 405 freeway in Los Angeles, but I was stuck on the 405 freeway in Los Angeles. And I was in 2012, and I heard on the radio a man who was running for U.S. Senate from Missouri say that a woman could not get pregnant from legitimate rape because she had a way to shut down her body. Uh, to Mr. Todd Aiken. Todd Aiken, Aiken yeah. yes. Um, and I was like, really? I, that wasn't actually what I said. It was something else. And then I thought, you know what? The Serbs didn't get that memo. I've had it. I've had it with this. I'm going to tell a story which takes the sex out of sex crimes and puts us where it belongs. It's an act of power, torture, and humiliation, and you will never get away with saying something so stupid again. <laughs> Absolutely. But let's face it, it's pretty depressing to cover rape and war. We all know rape and war is bad. We know rape is bad. So how do you tell a story which is about what to do about it? Um, I like the art of the possible. And so I thought, well, why not the first time it was prosecuted as a crime of war? But I promise you, I, I spent a good six months, and this is embarrassing because I'm an investigative journalist by trade. I spent six months researching the wrong case before I found Aki Really? Asu. Yeah. How, how did that happen? Well, there was very little information about AKAC out there, and the cases I had heard about were probably the ones that you've heard about, and if you have heard of cases being pursued, they, most of the ones that were known were from the International Criminal Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, so at The Hague, and that was what people wrote about and talked about. So six months researching one of these cases until I was having drinks with a, a human rights lawyer, and she said, what's your next movie? And I said, first time rape is prosecuted as a crime of war. She says, AKAC, and I was like, Aka what? And then I started finding everyone who was involved and realized that no one had ever told this story before. And then it was just sort of like magic. When you started finding the people that were involved, was there a sense on their part that this was a part of history, what they had done? Or did they sort of feel like, oh, you want to tell this story? Because as you said, you're the first person kind of telling this story. Did they feel like their story was historical? Well, something I've learned about lawyers is that every, every lawyer thinks they're going to write a book someday. Thank <laughs> God. Because they'd all kept their notes thinking maybe they would do that, but they, they never did. And so one of them said, I just thought this was a story I would tell my grandchildren. And then I, I came knocking. But no, they, they really didn't think too much about the fact that they had made history. And then, of course, one of the people in the film had no idea that, what, that her work had even had any role in it until I called. It's interesting that you that you start with Todd Aiken and hearing him say that because the uh, rape is rape no matter what, but the the rape that the the crimes that we're told about in this movie are 
absolutely horrifying. They're, they're devastating. They're an act of war. They're an act of genocide. And all rape is a form of power and humiliation. But do you ever, you know, do you think some audiences will have a hard time drawing parallels between what women experience here and the sort of experience that women have that Todd Aiken may have been referring to? That's a great question. So um, I also want to be really quick to clarify, even though the film only deals very specifically with these three witnesses who are women, they were the first in history to testify, let's not um, kid ourselves. Men are raped in war. Um, in fact, in Congo, the statistic that I was told was that at least 30% of all rape victims in that conflict are men, and those are the ones we know about. And this is something that ISIS is doing right now. Um, it, I, I've heard about and witnessed some terrible things. So it's all of us. We're all involved with this. Um, you know, what rape and conflict strips it down to what it really is. It's an act of deadly intent. And there's no ambiguity to that. And that's also one of the reasons why I wanted to tell this story. Because we do have to start using the correct words to talk about this. We're not helping uh, anyone who's been through this before by not talking about it accurately. Um, and in fact, I'll give you another example that has nothing to do with rape and war. Um, how many of you remember this story? It was maybe about a year ago. And it was a football team in Old Sayre Brook, New Jersey. And they got in trouble because the seniors were attacking the freshman players in the locker room. Yeah, and what they were doing is sticking their fingers up the rectums. And that's sexual assault. But the headline in the newspapers was, football team suspended because of hazing. And I thought, well, how do those boys react? to see that headline. Well, we're very afraid of the term rape yeah. and, and even sexual assault, the term sexual assault in this country. Not to bring it to this, but I mean, it's been almost, uh, almost miraculous that in the last month, the media has actually been willing to use the phrase sexual assault regarding uh, Donald Trump's comments on, on the bus because for the most part, it's, it's groping, it's inappropriate touching. Rarely do we want to use the terms, especially in this country, sexual assault and rape, because I think we're very, very afraid for some reason of lobbying or uh, lobbying those um, that accusation against the perpetrator for some reason. We have very little fear of, of humiliating victims, but we have a lot of fear for some reason when it comes to humiliating per potential perpetrators. I, I, that's, I'm so glad you brought this up. First of all, I, I started out as a sports writer. I wrote sports at the Chicago Tribune. I have never heard locker room talk, like, as it was described by Donald Trump, all right? Um, so I'll well, start. Well, it's not locker room talk. Of I mean, course not, but you know what? Like I just it. love that he said that. I was like, dude, first of all, I do not believe that man has been in a locker room. <laughs> I mean, any, any, any boy who, like, as, just very briefly, as a boy who spent his time in high school locker rooms, you know, in locker rooms, if any guy had said that, and you always talk dirty, you always, you say filthy things, but if anyone said specifically that, everybody in the room would be like, liar, shut up. Like, stop <laughs> talk. Like, who let, the, who let the liar in the room, you know? Yeah, absolutely. You know, and it's, it's one of those things where, because we're not, I keep coming back around to, we got to use the right words, we got to use the right words, and it's because maybe we get confused by using the word sex and sexual. Um, that's such a loaded term, and at, at our heart, we're a puritanical nation, right? And that's kind of screwed a lot of us up. <laughs> to, so to speak. But the fact is, I always come back to it's the ultimate act of bullying. That's try, not trying to make it trite with what I've seen in conflict, but that does, I think, get to the heart of what that really is. Because a lot of times, I'll give you an example. I get asked all the time about the men who have been attacked in conflict, and how many of my guy friends have said they're attacked by gay men? I'm like, no, dude. I mean, I, that, wow, you really don't understand what this is. It has nothing to do with desire. It has nothing to do with sexual identity. This has to do with the, the need to dominate. Violation. Exactly. And in the cases of when it happens in conflict, what I always find really interesting is why do some soldiers not go through with the orders to rape? because there are lots of cases where they don't go through with it. And I think the part of what our job now is as a society is to start taking these, this crime as seriously as any other crime of war. Um, I think what the film shows is that it's really hard to prosecute this stuff at any level. Um, and the one way that we, have to, that we can start to take charge is by t taking it as seriously as any other crime, because accountability works and by speaking up as well and one of the one of the elements of your film is that you have these women who who speak up who are witnesses and they uh testify behind a curtain but the film sort of reveals them can you talk about that process and finding them after the trial because you know the, all your footage is from the 90s essentially so finding them and interviewing them and that whole process yeah, the, um, the three witnesses, witnesses JJ, NN, and OO, um, they were the first in history to testify. 
and they were very easy to find. I found, you know, they were no waiting. No process, no, no process. They're just like, hey, um, I, I found them very quickly through a social worker who was involved in, in helping them heal. And I said, would they talk to me? And they did. And I said, would you guys be part of this film? And their whole basis was they wanted to help people so that they wouldn't go through the same thing that they had been through. So one of the things I wondered was, well, and at no point did I ask them what happened to them. And I still haven't. Um, we know something happened to them because they testified. But what was a much more interesting way to start the conversation was, why did you decide to testify? What makes somebody come forward and take a stand? And that's a really intriguing subject to start to explore. And they like that. They like talking about that. So there is a scene. It, um, they do break their code name for the first time. And that scene, they always had veto power over. But I will tell you about a couple of, uh, I'll tell you something interesting that happened. They, um, uh, witness OO did it first. Um, she said the, the two lines, which, you know, I said, would you mind saying these? She's like, oh, absolutely. Witness JJ, who's a very strong-minded person, took like 15 takes because she kept giving a speech in between, you know, my name is and I stand for all women. And I was like, okay, we really just need you to, you know. <laughs> um, and then witness NN, um, she was the last one. And we interviewed them on separate days. And Witness NN had a bit of a breakdown midway through the interview. And so I firmly believe as a journalist that when pe victims of trauma, survivors of trauma, um, start to relive that, you shut things down. You don't want them to go through with it. I, don't, I, I wouldn't want to be treated that way, so that's how I interview. So she excused herself to go to the, into the bathroom, and we shut everything down. Nick and I, my co-director, shut down the It's just the two of us. We shut down the lights, shut down everything. She comes back out, and she said, what happened? And we're like, you're, we're done. You know, you, you were great. You were amazing. Don't worry. You were fantastic. And, but you know, we're, you were, we, we, we've got enough. And she looked around. She said, but I haven't said the line. And that's when we realized that they had talked to each other. And I said, are, are you sure you want to say it? And she said, well, Michelle, how else am I going to get an American husband? <laughs> then she said, just make sure he's old because I need an old husband. <laughs> so, <laughs> Hey, that's what she said. She wants an old husband. Yeah, that's what she said. So <laughs> now you you you're talking about you know their trauma, of course. But uh, correct me if I'm wrong. I feel like I read that you suffered from your own sort of PTSD following the your work on this documentary. Can you yeah. talk about that a little bit? One thing that you're not told is a certainly no one ever told me this as a journalist that. Um, if you cover trauma, you can suffer vicarious trauma. And I did go out on my own to do a lot of the research and go to some very bad places and meet some very bad people, and I saw some very bad things. And th those things don't leave you when you get on the airplane to come home. And it, I absolutely had a bit of a breakdown. Um, we had just finished principal photography, and I will always describe it as I, I was having trouble sleeping, I was having panic attacks. Um, I would think something and open my mouth to say it, but something else would come out. And I was like, I need to get some help. And I was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it's very, very common if you put yourself out there like that. And what did you do to sort of overcome it? Did you? Therapy, 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 therapy. I also stopped my very favorite thing in the whole world, and I stopped drinking wine for a bit. It was so sad. <laughs> I'm back, though. <laughs> Bar Bartenders of New York, you're safe. <laughs> I am back in style. Um, yeah, and then just as that got unwound, then, of course, um, the accident happened, so. The accident that you're referring to is your co-director on the film uh, passed away in a car accident on his way to delivering the film, on his way back from delivering the film yeah. from its premiere at the Hamptons Film Festival. Yeah, we were premiering at the Hamptons Film Festival last year, and we were actually premiering as the big winner of uh, this, and so we were going to get a big fancy screening and a party, and we were both so excited because we'd put so much into this film, as all filmmakers do, and he was dropping off the film and, and sent me a picture of himself dropping it off, and he wrote, I'm proud of this film, I'm proud of us. And then um, three hours later, he was driving home and swerved to avoid three deer and hit a tree and died at the age of 34. And then we had to somehow finish this film because it wasn't done yet. Um, all the stuff that remained to be done were all the things that he did and he was really good at. And I w remember sitting on the floor crying, going, how am I going to finish this? And what am I going to do? And, and then the phone started ringing with people saying, what do you need? And I'm like, $600,000? They're like... <laughs> 
what else do you need? And we're like, what's a 5.1 mix? They're like, oh, honey, <laughs> we're going to get you some people who can help you. So a lot of a lot of people came forward to help me get this across the finish line. Well, that's incredible. It's because it's a, such a powerful, important story to tell. Uh, one of the things that I was fascinated when I, fascinated when I was watching the film is there's, an, there's a point where in the legal proceedings, the prosecutors, or like one of the prosecutors, excuse me for maybe incorrectly labeling somebody, uh, doesn't want to prosecute for, for, for crimes of rape. Uh, they only want to stick to genocide. Now, what was going on there? Because there's a lot of people who want to prosecute for this, but they don't believe that they can get it across because, was it just because it hasn't been prosecuted in so long and they thought that it jeopardized the case as a whole? That's a great question. So the lead attorney in that who was worried about it was a 31-year-old former deputy DA from the hardcore gang unit in Los Angeles. So he had experience with rape trials, and the problem for him was that they didn't have the mechanism that identified John Paul Acasey was having command responsibility, because the tribunal was prosecuting the people who gave the orders. And that's the kind of the, the tricky thing about a tribunal. They're going after command responsibility. So it, it wasn't there. And in fact, it wasn't there. The evidence that he was looking for wasn't there. It's like, okay, you have lots of evidence of women being raped, um, but what puts the defendant in that room, what puts him in the room as possibly being the perpetrator or giving the order um, or not stopping it. And they didn't have that until they were down to their third to last witness and it was the night before they're gonna put her on the stand and all of a sudden they get the break they need. And then they did something really gutsy, they stopped the trial. And if they had been a little older and had a lot more experience, they probably wouldn't have done that. And one of the things that's in incredible is this trial itself is so difficult for them to sort of prosecute normally because there's so many things that this judge is doing that, 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 that they wouldn't expect. And yeah. the, like at one point, the, the prosecutor can't object. Right. He's not allowed to object. Yeah, this is the first time that they're ever doing a, an international criminal trial. So um, th it hadn't been done before. So people were like, you, you know, they're making up the rules as they go along. Not just the prosecutors, um, but also the judges, like common law system versus civil law system. And the judges who were coming from the civil law system, which is basically the rest of the world except for the United States and the UK, um, when Pierre stands up to go, objection, he's badgering my, my, my witness. They were like, objection? What is that? <laughs> you know, do you have that in your system? Do you have it? Okay, we're not going to do that, Mr. Prosecutor. They're like, what? <laughs> How are we going to do this? And they ran out of paper constantly. Yeah, they had all sorts of crazy problems you wouldn't Probably expect. hot in the courtroom, Hot right? in the courtroom, yeah, and no resources at all. Like, they had to literally decide, are we doing an indictment or a letter or, or what? Wow, unbelievable. I'm going to open it up to the audience for questions. Does anyone have any questions out there? Hey, Michelle. Um, this looks awesome, and I'm sorry about your loss, but um, how did you switch, or why did you switch from writing to video? Because I think that this is so interesting and captivating, and um, maybe the future of courtrooms, like maybe one day lawyers will be showing videos instead of talking or mm -hmm. writing. Um, thank you for that question, because I'm actually a writer, and I spent four months writing the script, because one of the things we wanted to do was, again, how do you tell a story that people are going to be a little afraid to hear? And I was like, well, dude, it's the perfect narrative nonfiction story. I can tell this in a way that weaves multiple narratives, and I don't have to do the voiceover. But that's a really tricky thing to, to do. So as a writer, I took a lot of time to write, to put it together. Um, I told Nick I would write a, a treatment, and I came in, and I was like, here it is. He's like, it's 137 pages. And I was like, well, what's it supposed to be? He's like, 10. I'm like, oh, I'll be right back. So, and then we took, I took four months to write the script. Um, but it, for me, it was, um, I used to be on air, and I switched behind the camera because I, I could always write. And I was like, well, you know, no one's listening to me as the on-camera person. <laughs> what's that guy doing? They're listening to him. And they're like, well, that's the producer. I'm like, oh. I think I'm going to be a producer then. So, but I Oh, I relate. <laughs> <laughs> I think I might have just gotten you in trouble. Oh, uh, we could do a whole nother panel about <laughs> being an on-air personality and how people don't want to listen to the person I never on listen. Air. But um, I think the thing what I've really learned is that you can I the difference between writing a book and writing a film and doing a film is just incredible. I've done both and Tape doesn't lie, right? And there's something visceral and very true about watching something and feeling something that doesn't really come through on the printed page necessarily. Um, and I mean, I have a literary agent. She's really eager for me to write something again. And I'm like, I don't know if I ever will. I think this is kind of a cool medium to, to be working in. What do you think after having uh, studied this and made this documentary and sort of immersed yourself in uh, rape as a genocidal act and prosecuting it, 
How do you feel, obviously you feel badly about it, but uh, about what's happening with ISIS and the fact that they essentially publish online the, the atrocities that they commit and any other sort of uh, sexual genocides that are sort of, hap for lack of a better word, sexual genocides that are happening across the world? Well, there, there are quite a few. I mean, a gen genocide, of course, is the G word. Nobody wants to use it because it means that they, are, they have to take action. Um, but there, are, there is mass uh, sexual assault happening as a tactic of war in almost every conflict around the world and by every religion. Um, ISIS, um, wow. I mean, talk about being able to compile evidence and find command responsibility. Um, I, I'm amazed at how he, despite the fact that, the, that that has been so well covered by the media and go media, um, if it wasn't for the press continuing to cover this, it would be very easy for our leaders to sweep it away. Um, despite that, there's not a lot of focus by world leaders on what to do about that. And you still hear people, and I've been in these meetings within the upper echelons of lots of governments saying, oh, well, you know, rape, that's a soft issue. A hard issue would be the beheadings. And these are literally words I've heard used. And I was like, I'm not going to get into a torture off. I mean, it all sounds really bad. And there are children being sold into sexual slavery. Yeah, I mean, there are there are it's a, it's like levels of, of Dante's Inferno and finding a new level in terms of what they're doing and being gleeful about it and recording it and having like institutionalized sex slavery. Um, so I think that it's up to us if, if we're concerned about this to put pressure on our leaders to to take it seriously. I mean, if. If they were, if these were landmines, if this was, um, this was any other if white phosphorus, if it was poison gas, we would be hearing a lot about it. I mean, for goodness' sake, you know, Pres President Bush took us into Iraq, the, saying, "Well, he poisoned his own people." Saddam Hussein poisoned his own people with gas. I mean, why aren't we taking this as seriously? I'm not saying we need to go to war over this, but I'm, I'm saying just, I'm just laughing because that's not the greatest example. It's not the greatest any, example, but it like, gives you an example that they do talk about war crimes publicly and they do take it seriously when it's convenient. Well, Assad, right? we talk about Assad and poisonous gas uh, yeah. all the time, and we talk about the way that Assad and uh, potentially and maybe Russia, I think Russia as well, bombing Aleppo, but we don't necessarily discuss the how we're gonna prosecute the sex crimes that are being committed by ISIS. We mostly talk about how we're gonna sort of take over different uh, areas of land that they've captured, like Missoula. Yeah, I mean, and the thing is, accountability does work as a deterrent. Now, I don't know about these guys, because um, it's it's something that, it, it, it's at a different level than I've ever seen before in all what my research. What can you do at this point, other than just retake the, recapture the, the, the land that, they, that they've taken? Well, um, I, I printed up matchbooks that say, lawyer up, ISIS, we're coming for you. <laughs> I did. I have them for Boko Haram, too. I made sure they got to Nigeria. So um, I'm evidently, I have a death wish. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's important, I think, to, um, to make sure that the, these, I mean, you're talking about militias that, especially in the case of ISIS, that are extraordinarily tech savvy. So they are watching the world reaction, and they, the, the PR battle is important to them. And I think that's one thing where we can push back and push back individually or in groups. But as far as how we're handling this um, within our government and within the military, one of the things that's being pushed for is for, okay, who makes up, who comprises the people sitting around the table negotiating the peace treaty or any treaty? And this is where it gets interesting, because despite the fact that most uh, casualties in conflict, and in particular what's going on with ISIS, most of those casualties are civilian. So that means women and children are disproportionately affected. Ask me how what the percentages of women at the table for peace negotiations. Oh, I'm sure it looks like an old Friars Club meeting or something. Man, I think the Friars Club's got more women. Um, it's, it's less than 1%. So that's what um, what a lot of folks in the international community are pushing for, is to have more women at the table, to have it not just be military leaders sitting around, because they're not addressing all of the issues that are happening in what is conflict today. And I think we have to start redefining what conflict is. Well, if it's military leaders, you generally have a tactical conversation, I would imagine, rather than a human humanitarian conversation. Well, also, well, you're having the conversation about who, you know, what you're going to charge people with as well. I mean, how much evidence did they have during Nuremberg and the Tokyo tribunals um, in the 1940s to prosecute rape as a crime of war? Again, you saw from the trailer, it's been a crime of war since 1919. Why didn't they do it then? Well, you know, again, it was just sort of, it wasn't even on the radar screen. It wasn't even, they didn't, they, they weren't that interested in it. So it's, if, if they're not going to bring it up around those tables about prosecuting other commanders for issuing the command, then we have to bring it up to our leaders to push for it. Absolutely. Next question from the audience. Hi. Hi. 
I wanted to know, what are your, some of your suggestions on teaching young boys and young girls about consent? Well, boy, at what level? I mean, we're talking about there's so many, there's so many ways to go about that. You know, um, the first thing I would say is, and, and I, I've had, I, I've, I speak to a lot of schools, and I do come back around to the, the bullying tactic, the, the bullying definition a lot. And I find that that's the easiest way to start, for, for people to start to understand this. You know, it's, um, you're not, when, when, you, when you're saying, uh, and also to learn that words and gestures, and uh, that those things hurt. And you start from that basis. Um, and then as, the kids get, as, as kids get older, to start understanding what consent is. It's, it's a very, you know, I could talk to you for 40 minutes about this, but basically, um, depending upon how old the kid is, I always start with the bullying level because a lot of times, like, you know, you all you, people get confused. I, I have to say, I don't think that culture is giving kids the best idea, best examples right now, and that's very concerning for me. I've been really concerned with some of the, the language and the terminology I've been hearing over the last few months, not just from one of the presidential candidates, but I think as a society, we have to start thinking about exactly your question. What kind of example are we setting? Because those kids are looking to us and following our, our lead. Absolutely, I think we have time for one more question. Hello, Hi. so I just wanted to know, I know in some cultures when a woman is raped, they're looked at, at as tarnished goods because their virginity is so valued. So I wanted to know when you were making the documentary, um, what was the difference between when a woman gets raped and when a man gets raped? What was the outcome? That's a great question. I, thank you for asking that question. Well, here's one very, one very complicated thing. Um, a lot of times in those same cultures, homosexuality is outlawed upon pain of death. So when a man goes to seek treatment, if he goes to seek treatment, he's often accused of being gay and um, often risks being put to death. So it's extremely complicated to report this um, and to seek uh, medical attention because the horrible injuries that women get, men can get too. And oftentimes you have to, it goes beyond just the virginity or the homosexuality, humiliation, you know, all of these things where you're, it, it's all about destruction. And one of the things that got argued in, in the Akaisi case was that you don't need to die in order to be destroyed. And when you start thinking about that way, you realize why militaries use this over and over again. Because this particular act has a reverberation for generations. It can rip apart a family for all the reasons you just cited and the ones that I just said as well, and more, um, permanently. And if you rip apart the family, you rip apart the community, and you rip apart the society, and so forth. Michelle, how can people see The Uncondemned? We open on Friday. We open this Friday at the Landmark Sunshine, um, and then we were here for a week, and we moved to Los Angeles after that, and uh, and DC and Atlanta and beyond. And um, if you want to meet the ladies, they are here. They are here. And if you are an old American man and you'd like to meet NN, <laughs> you can meet her too. So they'll be uh, here this weekend. Michelle, congratulations on the film. Thank you so much for being here. Thank, Thank you, you so much.